Hello and welcome to this week's Cube Pod. I'm Sean Ferrer with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise, episode 48. Dave, great to see you. You're in your uh, office, not in the studio. I'm in my office as well for this Cube Pod. Um, not much going on this week. Uh, in, uh, <laughs> not, yeah, not another a, quiet not, week. Not, not another quiet week. I mean, it's only the most important stock on the planet Earth going supernova, going ballistic. Um, Goldman Sachs dubbed NVIDIA the most important stock on planet Earth. Um, certainly echoed by the market's response with its earnings yesterday. Um, I mean, their earnings report, well anticipated. You you predicted it right. Congratulations, unlike other analysts who were hand waving, saying it's a tailwind. Um, the paid paid analysts out there. The but the report really pushed a huge bullish market momentum. Stocks up the day after, hundreds of points. Just incredible run. Uh, from Nvidia, not new to us on the cube. Obviously, we've been, we've been chronicling the software aspect of that for years. The die was cast years ago with CUDA and all the other systems. Um, Nvidia is the story. Ironically, they stepped on the entire and completely put a wet blanket on Intel's big event. So, yeah. really, this pod uh, I would say um, dominates through. We'll talk about some other news and AI and bunch of other stuff going there is a lot of stuff happening actually but the two seminal moments this week just really to me put a uh, a real stake in the ground um uh, in this moment in time that really encapsulates the hype of ai right now i mean it is the super hype hyper hype ai hype you got the intel big event and then nvidia just completely throwing shade on it with its massive numbers and the thundering lead it has so let's get let's get into it and so much to go in the stronghold that they have on the segment dave is pretty incredible um you know you had an amazing tweet storm d Vellante on on x formerly twitter and on linkedin also you got some commentary got a great um set of comments on my post i even did a cube ai post uh, on there that summarized all the new but so many data points with nvidia it's, it's the most talked about topic in technology right now well, well yesterday was interesting because the day before palo alto disappointed well, you and i talked about that and it sort of sent the whole tech market down it certainly all the cyber stocks were off on sympathy and people i think at the time said wow maybe this, this tech bubble is bursting and that spilled over to nvidia yesterday and people were very cautious i mean stock was down um you know, not that the day-to-day -day stock movements matter, but you can't help but watch it because it reflects the sentiment in the market. And I put out a tweet saying, well, hang on. You know, so first of all, I said, you know, revenues are expected to to triple. Profits are expected to, to grow 7x. So these are really inflated. I can see why people are really cautious and maybe taking some profits ahead of the print, especially in, after the Palo Alto news. But then I said, well, th th there's a two-year backlog on their GPUs. They've virtually got no competition unless they have like very poor visibility on what they can actually produce. You would think they're actually going to beat their expectations. And so they did. And now, as you said, the stock is up over 100 points today, up 15%. But then the quarter was remarkable. I mean, $22.1 billion in revenue up 265%. And it was interesting that they talked about sequential growth of 22%. When when was the last time you heard a company talk about sequential revenue growth? You got to go back to like the right. 90s when, yeah. when tech was kind of booming and they beat revenue by 1.6 billion. And then their gross margin for the quarter, John, was 77%. That's, that's more than 10 points higher than Intel ever achieved. And uh, they're having an Intel. They're they're having an Intel moment. I mean, what the Intel, I had a post about this um, about in the Intel moment in the '90s. They're having it now. Dave, this Nvidia story is really a blend of strategic brilliance, technology, technological innovation, and market acumen. Jensen years ago set the table for this. So this is not new. Again, they have economies of scale. Everyone else is planning to catch up. We'll have diseconomies of scale. As NVIDIA navigates the ever-changing landscape, it's going to be incredible to watch the impact they're going to have on the AI market. It's, it's just the further advancements that they're making just increases their leadership. The, the, the multifaceted nature of NVIDIA's journey, it's a saga of a tech giant 
redefining the boundaries of what's possible. I mean, think about this. The dream is to join a startup and get paid. Now the startup journey is you become a unicorn, you're overvalued, you do it down round, you sell the company and you're still maybe get may get liquidity. If you were a janitor at NVIDIA six years ago, you're a millionaire right now. Okay. This is incredible story. It's a multifaceted journey. It's really a, it's a story about entrepreneurship in a big company. I think there's so much to this story that on how they've just made the right moves, right? And had the right focus. And again, this isn't a startup. This isn't like Facebook and then dominating. It's just like, you know, Facebook has a lot of NVIDIA kind of in it. You can still make money in the big companies. It's the it's the talk of Silicon Valley right now. It's like, hey, you'll know, you'll never make money to join a big company. Well, in this case, if you joined NVIDIA six years ago, janitor, worker, engineer, manager, you're rich. So Google, See, Facebook, director, NVIDIA. Money. <laughs> I mean, it's a profound a profound accomplishment. And so, you know, I'm very happy for NVIDIA on that one, but also I'm kind of scratching my head going, okay, there's still not, there's still a huge gap on product, right? Well, so, you know, the, the so, supply chain problems, the demand for AI, is this a seminal moment? Obviously the profound journey, love it. But Dave, well, you're, you know, what's your, what's your analysis of, of this as a future uh, headroom relative to NVIDIA stock? Also, that's a stock, their platforms. So I think, I think to 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 assess the question, you know, how long will this last? Is this just a bubble? Will, is this sustainable? Won't competition eat them alive? I think you got to go back to like at least 2006 when Nvidia introduced its CUDA software architecture. 2006, and then th the whole point of that was that the GPUs that it was producing needed specialized software, proprietary software, so that people could program for this new type of computing. This is like a long time ago. And then when, you know, all the DeepMind guys and Ilya, that, now you're talking still 2012 when the AI researchers started really getting into programming GPUs for building large language models. And then it took them years to perfect that. If you've ever heard Ilya talk about their journey, and how, you know, size mattered. And then when they started getting, you know, video and audio, it made a difference. And then in 2019, NVIDIA buys Mellanox and they tune their chips for InfiniBand. And then in 2021, in the middle of COVID, yeah. they introduced an ARM-based architecture. This is all before ChatGPT was announced. So the point of all this yeah. is that they have been building a moat for well over a decade and and they kind of lucked out. I mean, they were really, you know, <laughs> that's our how we kids were like, but your kids and my kids were like, can I get a PC for Christmas with an NVIDIA chip in it? Right? This is where their 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 whole business was gaming. Yeah. And then it turned into and then crypto. And crypto gave them a big tailwind. And remember the crypto crash? Yeah. How it hurt NVIDIA. The best then, thing that ever happened to NVIDIA and AI was the crypto crash. All those GPUs out there got repurposed instantly or AI. Yeah, that's a great point. Well, so me... I mean, I mean, so that I guess the, the, the my conclusion is, we are entering a multi decades of, of wave, where it's it, look at NVIDIA could make mistakes, mm -hmm. they could screw up, they could get, yeah. they could get, you know, arrogant and shoot themselves in the foot. But if they don't, I think they're going to dominate this market, I think they'll have 80% of this yeah. market, which is a uh, going to be hundreds of billions of dollars. Well, let me give you my research analysis on this. I did a little quick research note um, preparing for this podcast. I knew we'd get into it. I got seven areas to review real quick. The financial performance overview, obviously. The strategic positioning of AI and tech with NVIDIA. The future growth projections, competitive landscape, market industry perspectives, the tech buzz, uh, the risks and considerations, and then re my recommendations going forward and up the conclusion. So let's just get into it. The financial performance, Earnings smashing, the results were off the charts. Um, year on year, net income soared by 769%. Incredible financial performance. Okay, NVIDIA beat big time. They expected big, they got bigger. Check, check the box on financial. Strategic position. Don't forget the uh, valuation. It's uh, almost <laughs> 1.9 trillion now. <laughs> Incredible. So financial performance, everyone's you know happy. And that's that's, also powering the stock market. So NVIDIA now becomes, in my opinion, a bellwether. 
that's a little bit down in the analysis. Uh, point two, strategic positioning in AI and tech. Clearly, this puts NVIDIA as the market leader uh, in GPUs, especially with their Hopper series. That was key. You mentioned in InfiniBand. These clustered systems will define the new architecture. We've been talking about in the cube. The term clustered systems hasn't really been out there as nomenclature. It's been coined. It's, it, it means something. But I think you're going to see that become a category, clustered systems. Watch that space. We're going to be digging into it. We, we unpack that big time at the High Performance Computing Show, Supercomputing 23. There'll be more of that at every single event. Clustered systems, remember that name. It reminds me of Hyperconvergence Day. We're gonna see a lot about clustered systems with chips, pairing chips with software and other things. Pay attention to that. And then just demand the, uh, um, and the leadership. Supply chain resilience, okay? Diverse impact on their chips. They got strong sales on all their AI chips. So well-positioned NVIDIA. Future growth prospects. He anticipate another 24 billion, this huge upside to the stock. It's unbelievable. So if, if they can keep the resilience on the supply chain, then they're going to have the growth will kick in. So that's, we'll watch that. Competitive landscape, fourth bullet. Okay. Intel, huge competition. They're, Intel's challenged just to keep pace with NVIDIA. Intel's now in the shadows of NVIDIA, particularly in the AI and chip design. NVIDIA's advanced tech and market share keeps it well ahead of Intel. Intel's, you know, staring at, you know, at NVIDIA as it pulls away. AMD, also a key player, but still good, well positioned in the market. They're nipping at the heels. Don't count AMD out. So competitive landscape, there's demand for chips. Rising tide floats everybody, but still NVIDIA is pulling away. Uh, market and industry perspectives, global influence, tech community buzzes off the charts, rel totally relevant. Risks. Supply chain, okay, and the geopolitical, huge wild card. So if you're going to bet on the stock, we'll get to the analyst recommendations in a minute. There's two things to watch with NVIDIA, supply chain, and then the geopolitical factors, China specifically. We're going to see that play out. And then finally, my recommendation, it's a strong stock to have. I would definitely put money into it. I don't see that going away. And I, I would watch it and sell it, kind of keep track of it. And finally... My conclusion is NVIDIA is now officially a bellwether in the market, both on the financial stock side, strategic positioning, and their market maneuvers. I think you're going to see people copy NVIDIA around clustered systems. You're already seeing um, moves by Broadcom and others kind of putting chips together with software. This is, to me, an architectural shift. This might be one of those moments we look at saying, okay, NVIDIA was the, the pace setting uh, standard that's going to shift this cloud next gen AI. So yeah, just that's, disclaimer that's my, that's that my not, research note just, on, on the situation. That's a great analysis. Just a disclaimer, we're not giving investment advice. Um, yeah. But if we were, I would say buy the dip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. um, we're not real but, analysts, but we'll give you the scoop here. So, I mean, of course we're real analysts. I, um, I, I mean, I look at uh, I, the, the B of A analysts. Do we have to I, actually, do we have to say that we're no give investment advice? I don't know. I think it's good cover your ass. But the B of A analyst, who I find to be ex one of the best in the business, uh, in semis, I was just sort of walking in to this call and I heard him on the TV saying he thinks it's got 20% upside in NVIDIA. And who knows? With, with, but he thinks it's got upside. I, I, a couple of other sort of nuggets that I pulled out of the call last night, 40%, they claim 40% of the data center revenue was for the, for the year, fiscal year, was for AI inference. And Jensen in the Q&A said, this is probably low. Okay, so the reason why that's important is because everybody talks about, well, look, it's not just training, inference is going to dominate the market, totally agree. But then they think, they, they, they imply that that's good news for the competition, bad news for NVIDIA. And here's why I think that's not the case. First of all, NVIDIA is doing a lot of inf inference. Second of all, uh, one of the analysts on the call, CJ Muse from Cantor Fitzgerald, he asked, I thought, the most important question or very important question on the call, which is, he said, with the million X improvement in GPU com uh, uh, compute power over the past decade, do today's training clusters become tomorrow's inference clusters? And then Jensen's answer was, of course, yes, because one, those yes. are accelerated, and two, they're programmable. And then the other thing that came up on the call, which I thought was really telling, is Jensen said, why do you think that every cloud player, every hyperscaler is elongating its, its depreciation of servers now to six years? It's because the G, the, C, the general purpose CPU price performance curve 
doesn't warrant you having shorter life cycles. <laughs> you don't need to upgrade every two years like you used to, or even every three years. But every time a new GPU comes out, the demand is there. So it's a it's a complete shift in the buying patterns of semiconductors and data center. That CJ comment was really interesting. I quoted it in my report, by the way, I posted this morning. That was a great catch by you on that. That idea of programmability is huge. Now, I want to just make an extra point on that because, you know, when we came out of, uh, when we came, went into reInvent, AWS reInvent in December, you know, when I sat down with uh, Adam Solevsky, that was the key thing we talked about was inference. You look at all the trends, training is one thing and inference becomes the killer app. We we coined that term before supercomputing in De uh, in Denver. But if you, if you if you look at the cloud guys, if you think about what this AI trend will do for the cloud guys, it's incredible. I think you know, Howie Shu and I talked about this on, on a video we did this week. AI becomes a cloud dream. If you're a cloud player, AI really can help your value proposition significantly. If you look at Meta, okay, what they're doing, they're going to be in the game pretty quickly. So you got Meta, AWS, Azure, okay, all positioned beautifully for AI. And because, Google. And Google. I mean, I mean, Google's Google's uh, um, new Gemini is incredible. You and know, they got from, the data with YouTube. Uh, and the, <laughs> they get all the data. A, <laughs> Most of the data in the world is video, and they've got it all. Yeah, the, the 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 Gemini stuff is incredible. The, the Gemini Pro thing is going to be pretty game changing with video. Just the context window alone is incredible. So again, all the hyperscales, the big get bigger. But Dave, what does this mean for the marketplace? Again, we've seen big incumbents in these big waves. IBM back in the uh, '80s, not '70s and '80s, they were the dominant player, but yeah. they weren't as agile. They got toppled down by the PC revolution. And the and the networking rules. The question is, is that I'm I'm not sure that the big guys go away in this wave. I think I they get think bigger. So you're right. So so what is that going to mean for competitive the competitive strategy for a startup or even try to get some white space? So if you're an entrepreneur, you're a big company. Again, my point about Nvidia, and and a startup. There's more rich millionaires in Nvidia than there is in the startup ecosystem, generally speaking, because the market's better at Nvidia right now, and that's a big company. That's counterintuitive. If you go back to the, the uh, just a few years ago, it was cool to be in a startup. But if you're working for Nvidia right now, it's cool. Yeah, and 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 look at who's doing all the investing in startups is the the big cloud guys are doing tons of investing. But I want to I want to uh, land on something that you said about Adam Solipsky because I remember when the other thing he said to you is because you were talking about inference. He said, "Yeah, we're going to do inference. Going to be big, but you got to train it first. <laughs> a lot of action around training. And I think the cloud guys are going to do really well there. And, you know, this is one of those Matt Baker yeah. moments where it's not a zero sum game and it's not a winner take Matt all. Matt Baker, market. you mean from Dell Technologies? Yeah, Matt Baker from Dell. It's not a winner take all market, but I will say this you know, the, the, the Tim Crawford, you know, in that, that LinkedIn group that we're in, so it's actually really, really smart, bunch of really smart people. Tim was rightly saying, look, there's going to be a lot of specialized, you know, use cases here and um, a lot a lot of opportunity for semiconductor designers to develop those specialized chips. Totally agree. Two things. One is NVIDIA is going to play in that game. No reason they can't. And the second is, I don't think any of those guys are going to have monopoly-like margins that NVIDIA is enjoying. Um, so they'll do, they'll do great. They'll make a bunch of revenue. You know, Dell is a great company with whatever, 30% gross margin. But NVIDIA, we're talking about 77% gross margin, and they're guiding that it's going to, you know, long-term, their long-term model is mid-70s. Yeah. I mean, that's that's SaaS yeah. uh, marginal economics. David Floyer said to me in 2021, the post that we wrote, how NVIDIA is going to dominate the enterprise, that was May of 2021. Floyer said to me, Dave, NVIDIA is going to be so dominant, they could give away the chips and just sell the software and still have a, a viable business model. And yeah. of course, they're not giving away the chips anything, but prices went up this quarter. And David Floyer is one of the best key research analysts out there right now. I think he has done incredible work on ARM too. I mean, he's been talking about ARM for years, right? Talk about when everyone was like, go back a decade, the work we did on the, the chip formation. Um, ARM, we saw that coming early. We saw NVIDIA. Um, we saw what AWS was doing. 
uh, when they when they made that big acquisition. Um, again, you start to see what we're covering with, and you mentioned Gemini Pro 1.5. You start to see the formation of the infrastructure game. And if you, if you being the real key winners here. So if you look at the stock market pop from NVIDIA, uh, who wins on this? Google wins, AWS wins, uh, Azure wins, uh, even Oracle wins. All the big iron players, when I say big iron, big compute, big horsepower are going to win because the apps need this. I put it in perspective, you mentioned uh, uh, Gemini, which is Google's AI, Gemini Pro 1.5. Enormous upgrade to their AI models. That was 1 million token context window. It's huge. The previous record was Claude 2.1 with 200,000 tokens and GPT-4 Turbo with 128,000. The difference is staggering, right? You, and, and this is just the beginning, Dave. So as the infrastructure gets better, people like Snowflake win, people who store data. So the data play here is off the charts. Again, this is really nuanced in the industry, but if you look at the, the impact of this NVIDIA announcement, it points to the entire AI systems completely being modernized. That means every single company that's got growth and or assets in this market will win. There'll also be a set of losers. So what we're going to start watching and analyzing is the winners and the losers, because there's going to be losers on this wave. People are going to be driftwood from this wave. They're not going to make it. So we're going to, you know, as this is going to be the real analysis, okay, that's going to come out of this market. So if you look at, you know, our big discussion around, you know, industry analysis and financial analysis, the winners have to be positioned because you can't fake it till you make it in this market. You know, you can't, you don't deliver, you don't have it. You don't have it because you got to have it to win. Uh, it's, it's exciting, Dave. I got to tell you, I've never been so pumped. Well, you mentioned up front the that the NVIDIA news kind of overshadowed the Intel Foundry day, which I don't yeah. know if you saw that. I did, um, but you were you were all over. Get, give us a lowdown of what happened there. I mean, I wrote a post on well, it, I mean, it covering was, it. It was it was a very highly produced. I mean, it was really an incredible production. Um, and look at you gotta you gotta tip your cat cap to the way Pat Gelsinger plays his hand. I mean, it's brilliant. He had an amazing cast assembled, you know, CEO of ARM. He had the, the commerce secretary come in, you know, over the wire remotely. Satya participated, Sam Altman, and he, they on and on and on. And they positioned it as the first, the world's first AI foundry. And which is, you know, again, yeah, trying to yeah. position TSM. And they're basically saying, look, TSM is monolithic. We've got the, the future with the chiplet era and, uh, really, I mean, brilliantly packaged, but I have to say, and it gives me no joy to say this, the bottom line is still the same, John. Intel is losing share. You mentioned yeah. AMD. They're losing share to NVIDIA. ARM wafer volumes are 10x those of x86. And, you know, Pat swipes at NVIDIA's packaging, but NVIDIA and TSM, in my opinion, are ahead in packaging for AI. Now, uh, Tim Baharin, who, you know, I, I'm no expert in this field, but and Tim is deep in it. He feels like that's not the consensus. But I, I will tell you, in, in talking to my sources and, and brilliant people as well, like David Floyer, that chiplet approach solves a problem that that Intel can't solve with let big me, chips. Let me, let me ask you a question, because I think this, let this say, is- Let me just finish. It can't make big chips. What does that mean? For AI because they can't get the yield. So it's a classic case, in my opinion, of they can't fix it, so they're featuring it. And I'd like to dig into that a little bit. So why don't you explain chiplets, what that means. Okay, chips, obviously we know what silicon chips are. And when you say big chips, put it in perspective. Let's let's unpack this Intel, because I do agree with you, by the way. I'm rooting for Pat Gelsinger, but just when you start to see a lot of window dressing on events, there's not a lot of meat in the bone then you got to kind of roll your eyes a little bit. So I felt Intel a little bit over the top, a little hyperbole there. But let's look at, and I'm clear they were overshadowed by NVIDIA, so that didn't help them either. So but let's get into this chip list, because I think that was the innovation that Intel had was their strategy to be something different. And why do you say it may not work with the versus, say, big chips? What are chiplets? And, so and explain. So I think chiplets are going to have their place. But by, by the way, chiplets are nothing. I mean, they're not new. I mean, the packaging is modern and then Intel's using EUV technology, which again, they relate to adopt EUV. Everybody knows that, but they they now finally getting on board and adopting advanced 
EUV, but it's a 40 year old technology. It goes back to IBM mainframes. Back then wafers were really tiny and the technology to make big chips that didn't exist. It was actually, interestingly, it was the consumer markets that brought big chips. And I'll explain what I mean by that was the iPhone. And as almost always is the case, it, it trickles in to the, to the enterprise. But so you think about it, yeah. think about a Grace Hopper chip. You got all these layers of memory and the key to their architectures, you have a huge, I have a huge amount of SRAM, just you know, non-volatile RAM. It sits on the chip and it has all the all the different components share that memory. So it's the CPU, the GPU, the the language processing unit, the neural processing unit. All the accelerators have synchronous access to that memory in that big Grace Hopper chip, and that is the core of solving the AI problem. AI, big data and big compute. And you need fast connections between all of that. That's where InfiniBand comes in. That's why I don't think InfiniBand's dead. We had had that little debate. It's the internal networking that Mellanox brought to NVIDIA. So when you make chiplets, which is what Intel's doing, you're taking a bunch of smaller chips that with much, much slower connections between them and they're asynchronous. And so Intel's saying they got 95% yields on their, their chips, but if they can't make big chips at high yields. They just don't have the volume. And so it's a way for them to get to market and chiplets are going to have a place in the market. There's no question about that. But for the high end, high well, when you say When you say big AI, chips, you don't mean, you don't mean like size because like the iPhones have big chips in them. Right? iPhones, a big chip or a big chip architecture yes they have a, a big shared sram with npus and cpus and gpus all sharing that resource as opposed to the the chiplet approach those connections are asynchronous so it's an order of magnitude less bandwidth and slower yeah. and it's just yeah. not the winner in my opinion yeah. for uh, uh, ai the ai era those so-called monolithic which i know is a pejorative uh, is going to win. The, the, you're trading off performance with the smaller chips, which is really relevant in AI yeah, because yeah. those connections between the chiplets, by definition, are slow, yeah. or certainly slower, and they're asynchronous. So I, I, AI, I to... AI gives monolithic the advantage. And, yeah, and I guess the other one more point, if I may. So Tim brought up in Twitter, and he's right that there's a rumor. Tim Crawford. That Tim Crawford. No, sorry, uh, uh, Ben. I said ben, Tim. Yeah. Ben Baharan brought up, and he's, and he's probably right, he's closer to it than I am, that NVIDIA is supposedly adding a chiplet architecture. They might be working with Intel to do that. It, and I'm saying, okay, great. They're doing it because they can. It's additive to their high-end AI machines. The reverse is not true. Intel can't get to monolithic. They can't get the yields. So it can't play in the high end. Jensen's going to own that. He's yeah. going to get 80% of that market. And look, at, yeah. maybe Jensen's wrong about the AI factory, but I, I, I wouldn't bet against that. I mean, I mean, I, I think I make I comments at reInvent when he mentioned AI factory. I think what he means by AI factory, I think he means AI operating system. These clustered systems is a real mm -hmm. deal. I mentioned it in my report, and what you're getting at here is interesting. I that's why I brought up the iPhone because when you said big chips, my mind went, oh yeah, size, a big motherboard, like a like a PC. No, it's 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 monolithic in the sense that it's it's controlling a lot of the parts for shared services, not trying to be a small bunch of collections. So silicon diversity is a big trend right now. So, but what you're saying is AI needs more horsepower with that monolithic architecture. So to me, this is an architectural debate. Is that the right approach? So my feeling right now is I believe that the current Grace Hopper clustering with InfiniBand is beautiful if you're a hyperscaler. You got constraints on power. You can have, it doesn't matter how many GPUs you put in a rack, you're going to be constrained on things. But by bolting them together in the clustered system is a good concept. You get more throughput. It's a supercomputer, basically. But can you do that on an iPhone? <laughs> okay. So, like you said, how do you make that architecture scale horizontally in, and also enable that same kind of power? I think that's going to be smaller, faster, cheaper clustered systems. So, who, what runs all this? What software, Dave? So this is where we've been teasing yeah. out on the cube yeah. uh, over the past two years and last year in particular, is there going to be a new operating system? Nvidia could win the OS model for AI. 
If yeah, the I mean, AI, if the AI factory is code words for, we're the next Linux for AI it, for metaphors. If that's great example, that's a great metaphor. I mean, CUDA is that OS, and they've got hundreds and hundreds of libraries for very specific use cases. And again, chiplets are going to be useful, but for the most rigorous AI, where shared memory is critical, chiplets are going to fall short. And and I would argue that. In the AI era, Intel, I think, is calling it the chiplet era, but in the yeah. AI era, bigger chips with fewer connections, yeah. I'm, I think, are going to be the winner. And they're going to have the best price performance. So if that's the best true, performance. If, if, if let's just take our insight, just say our, we're, we're connecting some dots here. If you, if you look at their stock today, 700, pushing 800, okay? Oh, my God, the stock's too high. The, that's a trillions of dollar valuation. No one, everyone would get scared of that. But if they truly are the operating system of AI, go back to 1988. I remember the moment when I realized that, oh, my God, Microsoft's got the operating system, system software, and the application stack. That's a monopoly. They stock, Their stock price was pushing it high right then. They were already overvalued. If you had bought Microsoft in 1988 as a stock, where would you be today? You'd be pretty rich. You'd be pretty rich. <laughs> We don't give stock advice. NVIDIA, though, could have that same vibe. So again, if you look at their track record, that's what you're looking at. If their software model, this AI factor becomes the AI operating system, then you want to bet on NVIDIA. And again, the wild cards are competition, geopolitical, and supply chain. If you look at those things play out, if I was laying all my chips down, I look at those three things, and if they, I feel like that's going to flip in, in the favor of NVIDIA, then their lead just extends. And then they might not be able to get caught up by anybody else because it, if you're anyone else, there's too many diseconomies of scale that put you in a position of potentially faltering. You might be able to match the story with some capabilities, but to get the trajectory of that experience is just going to be very difficult. So I here's mean, I, I think I think Amazon could be one to watch, Google or Meta. I mean, Meta is with the Broadcom Hoctane on the board. Hmm. I think that's Interesting. That's an interesting wild card. So here's a here's an interesting thought exercise. You remember in, in 99 and 2000, Cisco was the most valuable company in the world. So, and then dot com blew up, and you know, then Cisco's a great company, but you know, not the most valuable company in the world. Uh, is Nvidia the next Cisco, or is it the next Intel, Microsoft, next monopoly operating system of the data center, as you call it? Um, I don't know. I think it's. I think that I, might I, be the wrong company to compare them to. I think more like Microsoft. I think my analogy of system software and operating system is interesting because at that time, Microsoft was under the radar. They're just a PC company. They had DOS, and then Windows became the DOS en en enhancement. Okay, you can argue that could be NVIDIA's move into AI factory. The applications are driven by the AI thirst for GPUs. They kind of own that by default. So you can call that the application layer. Um, then you have potentially a better analogy. All Cisco had, really, what well, Cisco didn't have any technology. They had a collection of, of piece parts that they acquired over the years. But what Cisco had that nobody had at that time was they had the position locked in everyone's routes. So routing software and routing tables were connected systems. Those connected systems were hard to replace and, and switching costs were extremely high. So if you had Cisco, you couldn't really switch. You'd have to shut down your company, hire a bunch of people. The costs were way too high. They had a monopoly on networking. And they milked that monopoly, made so much cash, and then did a lot of acquisitions and created little moats and little pockets, but still always had that problem of being one unified thing. Okay. And so Cisco did a good job of keeping that going. Okay. Right. Microsoft continued to got into they got into the internet, they had the browser. They kind of made some mistakes under Balmer, but then Satya Nutella corrects everything. So, yeah, so, yeah. so that's why, again, so the reason I bring up Cisco is because the think of the think of era. So the internet era, you know, the information highway, all that stuff. Cisco was the network and the on-ramp to the information highway. And that's why people said, okay, they were the picks and shovels, if you will. A mm -hmm. lot of people look at NVIDIA as the pick of the shovel. I like what you're saying about, I mean, they, they actually leads me to, to say, are they the next Cisco, which is, hey, good company. Once they used to be the most valuable in the world, now they're just a good company. Or maybe a better example on the other end of the spectrum is, are they the next Wintel? 
John. That's kind of what you're implying with Microsoft. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, exactly. I mean, they're different markets, same generation, but Microsoft had that going into the internet. Remember, Cisco was formed uh, in the 90s with TCP IP when the OSI model came out. What that right. did was it disrupted all the mini computers who had proprietary operating systems. IBM had SNA, digital had DECnet, everyone else had other things. So that was the proprietary mode at that time. But once the 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 standards, Ethernet, and then uh, TCP IP created internetworking, that category enabled massive growth, wealth creation, market growth, new companies, everything happened after that in a big way. The internet was born. Um, everything just went supernova. So again, that was the Cisco wave. Microsoft had the software side. They had the monopoly. So if, G if GPUs is the new monopoly, then NVIDIA has to create a moat, but also a sustainable competitive advantage. And they, the, the software gives it to them. They get that, they get that AI factory to become the connected system for clustered systems. Then you could argue that clusters are the new data center. Clusters will be at the edge. They'll be at the core. They'll be at the on-premise. So clustered systems is something to watch. And again, remember that term, because I think we're going to come back to it a lot. So can you imagine, I, I'm always crapping on Lena Khan. Can you imagine, I you know, can't, can't remember if we talked about this in the Cube Pod before. Can you imagine if NVIDIA was able to buy ARM? Now, Lena Khan didn't kill it, but her proxy in the UK did. Yeah. Um, they were going to pay $40 billion for ARM. And arms today worth 130 billion, and SoftBank yeah. owns like 90% yeah. of it. Imagine if if Nvidia got that. So maybe they yeah, did get yeah. it right. Yeah, they would. I mean, I, 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 mean I think that's why I think AI systems is like camouflaging their their play. I mean, Nvidia right now is going to create so much awareness to their market. Um, you know, what's the old expression Jeff Bezos used to say? Your margin is my opportunity. That couldn't be more true than this. What they're doing right now. You know, John. Remember Jassy said to you, he said, I'm not sure Jeff ever said that, but it's good. good <laughs> I don't think, story. I think Jassy was just trying to cover for Jeff because it's been quoted, but because it's been sourced so many times, he pretty much should own it at this point because it's been super glued to his thing. But mar the margin is your opportunity means there's barriers to entry. People are going to come in this market. And NVIDIA just created a massive splash in the global financial and industry technology pool. Biggest splash of all time. I mean, just today, this is Thursday of this week, the biggest rally of the year on the stock market as of right now, globally, because of NVIDIA. This is going to be the moment we look at saying, this is where AI really becomes, wow, super frothy, right? Big okay, time. But are you saying, so, you know, that quote that's attributed to Jassy, you think about, you know, physical retail and how Amazon has been disrupting that. Um, you think about so many examples, Uber, your margin is my my opportunity to the taxi guys. Are you saying that NVIDIA's seventy mid seventy percent gross margin is an opportunity? Well, is that like in my in my seven point research note I just read earlier in the pod, I think it's all the the bub. It's one. It's the financial uh, opportunity, money to be made. That's the number one. Hey, this shit, there's cash to be made here. I want that margin. Two, leadership. So what's happening is that will this. The reason why there's a global stock market surge and probably a technology surge from infrastructure and chips is because everyone from Dell to HPE who makes PCs to anyone who's building any systems, because remember, clustered systems will be the future, they're going to all win. So again, there's going to be a massive list of winners and then a list of losers. This is what's going to happen in the smart executives, the smart teams, whether they're a startup or a big company being the next, that will become the next NVIDIA, they're going to go after that market opportunity because it's a large market. <laughs> What's the old investment thesis, Dave? Go after a large market with a with a okay product, you'll do good. Go after a small market with a great product, not so good. Here, you're going to see people enter the market. The demand is going to be massive for AI systems. And the operating system, the infrastructure, the apps that run on them is going to create a, a, a massive renaissance, a Cambrian explosion, wealth creation, huge trajectory of value. And and this is why everyone's kind of running as fast as they can with things like RAG, retrieval augmentation generation. That's a data play. The, the, the Gen AI stack, no one has yet built, in my opinion, a full so, a Gen AI native tech stack. That's going to come. So right. there's a lot of things evolving so fast. It's just, it's just incredible.
back to the competition because the tech industry is there are a bunch of alphas, right? And so there's you got guys like Jassy, you got Frank Slootmans, you got Satya, you got Lisa Su, Jay Shri Ulal. These are all alphas. They want to be <laughs> winner, right? And and they don't like when other companies yeah. get monopolies. So they're all sharpening their knives right now against NVIDIA, you know, saying that NVIDIA is gouging. Don't don't leave out uh, China companies either, by the way. Well, that's the other thing is China, to me, China is one, one of Intel's biggest competitors. They're, they're in a, Intel's fighting a multi-front war. If China, fighting, if, if, if they don't export uh, their stuff to China, China will build their own. Oh, well, yes and no. But so maybe. Here's the thing. I forgot to mention, we were talking financials. All this, how can we not mention this? All of this NVIDIA blowout goes down with virtually no China, single digit, like China contribution, okay? And they said, it's just going to be single digit going forward. So they had a big China business that is getting decimated because the US government won't let them sell. So they've come up with other products, but that's without China. Now, where China is, I think, of concern for Intel I mean, and for everybody longer term, but or Intel in particular, it's like it's like when China got into the steel business. Mm -hmm. eh, they're doing rebar, low end stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I fear that Intel is going to, an Intel foundry is going to get stuck with a lot of the the low end yeah. processes. They're, they talk about their advanced processes, but they'll probably suck up a lot of the low end business. They're yeah. partnering with China, China foundry. So some of that IP is probably going to trickle. So. You know, that to me is a big competitor. They got AMD fighting. Yeah. They got NVIDIA crushing it with AI. They got ARM with all their wafer volume standards. They got the 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 the, the, the hyperscalers are all yeah. developing their own silicon. So yeah. Intel's just surrounded. And then they're fighting TSM and Samsung. Yeah. I with mean, the all of becoming the number two foundry. I mean yeah. all, this all, is, all this is all this is coming down to who where do you run your AI? Where do you host it? Like right now, managed services exist like OpenAI. The Llama and the Mistral open source models, the foundation models, are growing like crazy. So you have this frothy developer environment and the underpinnings that support that infrastructure and platform software is running, built, rising up to meet the demand. So when you ask the question around long-term prospects for NVIDIA and this new architecture, complex systems, distributed computing, um, clustered systems, the things we're kind of kicking around, you got to look at two areas to see where NVIDIA will flinch or competitors will win. And that is, if there's going to be a shift in the market dynamics, okay, if, this, if the market changes rapidly to some other position, okay, and the competition intensifies, that will be the tell sign. So if you look at the next year, is there rapid market shift? Does it stay on course? And what's the competition do? Those are the tell signs. That's what I'm looking for. If those things stay the same in this three-level stack, infrastructure, software, apps, super chips, super cloud, super apps hits, you're going to have a super cycle. I mean, that's what's happening, Dave. And I think that, you know, if, if that stays in, NVIDIA wins to the operating system. Yeah, so if, it, if it doesn't happen, then there's an opportunity for competitors to kind of get position in there. So it, it, this is going to be the big land grab. This is why I love your analogy of these, the Cisco and Microsoft conversation, because those were the beginnings of a big market that was developing. Yeah. So let's talk about the competition. I mean, what, what competition is what I would say. AMD. Okay. They got some, some AI chips coming out. Intel. I mean, you saw, you, know, I found it, you should see, watch the Intel replay. I mean, it was a big production and music and, guys in hazmat suits throwing around whatever of swag i mean it was big audience every time pat was up there i mean it was i'm we'll like see. wow okay we'll yeah. big celebration so the thing about intel john is by my count they're building six fabs and pat gelsinger by his own admission says these things cost like 30 billion now a year so where's intel going to get 180 billion they're not going to it's not the cash flow of the business isn't going to throw that off are they going to take out 180 billion dollars of debt not likely are they going to get $180 billion from the U.S. government, which is $33 trillion in debt? Not likely. Is Sam Altman going to write him a check for a trillion dollars, maybe a couple hundred billion if he gets his $7 trillion? Maybe, but I don't yeah. really know what that's all about. So the, I, I keep saying Intel 
could run out of money trying to build all these fabs. Why do you think they're delaying building some of these factories? Because they just don't have the cash. Dave, what a great week. Um, big focus on NVIDIA, gra groundbreaking. I mean, record setting, Wall Street, Intel, all the chips are going to win. Semiconductors hot. Silicon is hot. The silicon angle is big. It's happening. Go to siliconangle.com. The Cube Research. Check out that site, cuberesearch.cuberesearch.com, cube.net. Dave, we, uh, we'll wrap it up. We're going to be in Barcelona next week for Mobile World Congress, now called MWC, with a massive set there. we got the executives from Broadcom coming on, talking about chips. We're going to have the um, CEO of HPE, CEO of Dell, CEO of Cisco, C a lot of all the top executives going to be coming on. Juniper. See, see, you, um, see you next time. We'll be doing the next Dream podcast Networks. from Barcelona. Oh, we'll yeah, see you next time. Awesome. That's it. See you guys. See you next Thanks. time.